What's up, you guys? This is Jessica Michelle, and you're listening to Scott Lips on Lips LA. Hey, guys, we're sitting here with Paul Banks from Interpol, one of my favorite quintessential New York bands and Thank you. all around great dude. I actually think Interpol, when I tell people about the New York scene in the last 20 years, I always talk about this, but obviously some of my other brothers, like you guys, The Strokes, the AAS, LCD, honestly, there's not really many other bands that left a mark on rock and roll for me in the last 20 years coming out of New York, wow. unless I'm forgetting like The Walkman or some of the like smaller bands. I think The Walkman are always cool. worthy of mention. Yeah, I think yeah, definitely. I, I, my feeling about The Walkman is that they'll be a band that at any point could have kind of a beautiful resurgence where, where they get discovered and then it's like the coolest kid in high school has got like the Walkman t-shirt on yeah. and you know like somebody else got the cure or the strokes or something and like there's some guy with like the Walkman and then I feel like people could discover them like the Velvet Underground you know but you guys and you guys have been together I think for 21 years now right so I feel like you yeah. guys and the strokes are around the same time period from when I remember and it's funny because Obviously, for me, your music was more brooding, dark, Joy Division, I don't know, maybe Echo and the Bunny Man. Like, I even, do you ever listen to Lords of New Church? I don't listen to anything I'm supposed to okay. have listened to being in Interpol. Well, obviously, it's more, it's obviously, your references for me are more dark and brooding, but so cool. And, and I, even though you're not from New York, because you moved around a lot growing up, right? You were in Spain, you're originally from London, but, um, you know, you were from Essex, I think, right? From yep. Essex, exactly. But, but still, like, the quintessential New York band, I mean, it, music has changed so much, and obviously being one of those bands in the last 20 years that really made a big impact coming from New York, like, where do you think it's going? It's going in such a different direction. You're, you're doing collaborations, even, like, hip-hop collaborations, and I know you just had a record out with RZA, which is really cool. Yeah. But um, where is it Where is it heading for you? Because you're, you're holding the rock flag, and it's a very, you know, you have a very particular sound, an amazing sound, but rock to me is something I never want to see go away because... Mm. It's my soul. I still get to play every now and then with Courtney Love. I wish I got to do it more. But, uh, you know, it's it's my passion, and I feel like in the end of the day, like, it, it's great to still have people. I know in South America, people are super passionate about rock and roll. Totally. Where is it, where is it going here? Because I think it's still uh, it's still around. I, I really think it's just – I mean, I got a lot of things to say about that, but I want to first circle back to the New York thing and just say that Ratatat is a oft-overlooked band Sorry, from, yeah, from I forgot that about era. That True. But and I also I often feel like commenting like I remember back in the early 2000s after Franz Ferdinand and the Strokes came out I'd be watching TV and there'd be some like commercial for like a camera or a car and like the sound would just be like a complete rip off of the Strokes or Franz Ferdinand and I remember kind of thinking like they've got some asshole who's really good with music and they're just saying like yeah just make it sound like the Strokes but like so we don't get sued and, right, and right. they literally know what formula like okay if I play a third the legal precedent is that you can't say I'm stealing a riff from Franz Ferdinand or, right. or the Strokes, you know, but you, people are going to hear it and, and liken it to those kind of cool bands. Yeah. I think Ratatat out of everyone has the most sort of discernible influence across genres of just like sort of production choices. My, my friend is a guitar player, Mike cool. Ratatat. Yeah. And he kind of did this reverse Ebo stuff and just sort of certain layering things that you hear it in hip hop from like Cuddy and I know they work together. Yeah. But you really hear their influence in a lot of places in the way that I used to hear the Strokes and, and, and Franz Ferdinand. I just feel like Ratatat maybe doesn't get the due that they deserve. As I got to go back and listen to them because I'll be honest. Like, I remember hearing them a little bit, but I, I just always pick you guys as, well, like, one and, of those. And you wouldn't necessarily lump them in with us because they don't have vocals or anything. Right. And they're kind of, like, in some category that's not quite rock. Yeah. So I, I just put it, I just wanted to, like, yeah, footnote totally, that totally. Ratatat needs to get love more often. But I, I think your your grouping is is you know appropriate for the for that moment in time in new york rock uh where i think it's going you know i prefer hip-hop i listen to hip-hop pretty much exclusively throughout the inception of interpol to the present i'm yeah. not really someone that listens to a lot of modern and contemporary rock but you I, even dj hip-hop as yeah. you did right yeah, yeah. still yeah pretty cool um that being said, I love the genre of rock music. I love playing rock music. I've never had an inclination to like do rap. I like playing guitar and I like singing and I like being in a rock band. And uh, so I don't really mind that like culture has shifted away from rock being a mainstream thing and it's now just sort of like pop and hip hop and electronic. Like that's actually fine with me because I, I listen to that stuff. But I also feel like as hip hop went from sort of being something um, not mainstream and then becoming mainstream, those those changes will continue and i feel like it could be a resurgence of something else that kind of comes back and replaces you know once there's a 
what's the it's like a maximum there's a term for a saturation point yeah when when, when there's a bubble that bursts then yeah. obviously then we were just talking about or that people time. or something has just become so mainstream right. that now it has like people are looking for something else now definitely and so i kind of always feel like it'll just take like one punk band right or one sort of really heavy alty type of band or even classic rock you yeah. to just kind of kill it and then all of a sudden the landscape is going to change and i think you'll have another resurgence of rock definitely and i think part of the thing that keeps rock alive through all of these changes in, in pop culture is that as a live spectacle i think it's still kind of like unparalleled and i think like, that that'll always be the case for sure yeah. and so speaking of which you have this is your sixth record which is pretty awesome and um such a great record um i want to talk about the video in a second for the rover so i want to actually I want to jump to the rover, which is one of the greatest new tracks on the new record, and talk about the video. I know Evan, and I think we have so many connections that we never talk about, but it's so cool to see him in that video. I hadn't seen yeah. that video before. And so Evan, who's actually in, he's on the show Girls, who I know, and, and Elena, you know, his girl, wife, actually wife. Yep. Um, I know all these guys. We're, me and Paul connected in, in many ways, so many, many of us, uh, we share a lot of the same friends. So let's jump to the rover. We'll come back. We have so much to talk about. Not that much time, but we're all going to squeeze in a minute. So this is the rover by Interpol. They're playing this Thursday. If you're listening to this, it might have passed, but at the Hollywood Bowl. So I also want to talk about that. Um, Paul Banks, Interpol, you're listening to Lips LA Radio on Dash Radio. All right, guys, you just heard the rover. Um, Interpol. We're sitting with Paul Banks. Really excited. Paul, so tell us a little bit about that video. The video is like pretty trippy. We talked about Evan being in the video. It's like, is it a mock press conference or was that like a real press conference you guys were doing when the, he kind of like bum rushed that press conference? It's two It's two separate concepts. We we had the idea, um, actually the, the head of Matador, Chris Lombardi, I think it was his brainchild initially to do a press conference to announce the record and to make it in Mexico. And, and so that was a serious, legit press conference that we were going to do. Um, you're big in Mexico too. We're big in Mexico, yeah. and I think it was, it's it's a it's a market that's really important for us, and it's also somewhere I, I graduated high school in Mexico, and mm. we have a lot of friends from there, and I've like it was a very influential place for me. So we're really just sort of like it feels like a second home to us, uh, and it just seemed like a really great idea. Like okay, cool, let's do like an old school press conference. So you're thinking like Paris, Chicago, or New York, LA, Detroit, or whatever. How about Mexico City? You know, that's sort of the unexpected. Right. But so that was do. was that a real press conference? It was or? an absolutely real, legit press conference. Oh, it was. Okay. But then simultaneous to that, like I had this idea for a video for that song, and it featured the character of the rover was going to be in the video, and then it was my bandmate Daniel, who's good friends with Evan, uh, who said, "What about Evan for the character?" And I know Evan from his work, and I thought, like, I, I really can't think of anyone that would be better for yeah. that for that role. Like, he's really got something, and he's really got whatever something I see in the rover. Like, this actor has that. So. So now we've got this idea. We're going to do a video, and it's going to have Eben, and we're already going to Mexico City for a press conference. So then we start talking about this great Mexican director, Gerardo Naranjo, who Narcos Eben, or something? Um, he's directed, yeah, a number of episodes in season one of Narcos. He made a couple features. He's worked with a very close friend of mine from Mexico as well, and Eben brought him up, oh, the director. Cool. Right. And so then we're like, yeah, okay, that's a great idea too. So now we got a Mexican director, we got Eben, and we're doing a press conference in Mexico. <laughs> So someone thought, like, why don't we fuse this concept that I had for a video with the trip to Mexico? And then I don't know whose idea it was to actually, like, literally morph the video and the fiction and the reality of the press conference and have him bum rush the press conference. It was such a cool idea. Thanks. Yeah. And, and what was really cool about it, I think, is that when you consider that Matador and our label and our, you know, we were going to do a legit press conference, a lot goes into that. A lot goes into just the technical execution of streaming that shit everywhere. Of and we get them, then we go to them and say, hey, we're with this director and this actor, and we kind of want to, like, interrupt the whole fucking press conference with this absurd, surreal sort of, like, Andy Kaufman yeah. moment. And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. I couldn't so tell it was, if it was real or not, but it was just cool. And I think that's because it was yeah. probably, you know, I think we kind of pulled it off, yeah, which, was, yeah. which was really satisfying. But it was, yeah, it was basically we just in, we... Um, forced the video onto the reality of the press conference right. with no complaints from anyone involved in the press conference. That's cool. And I, and I read somewhere for this album, you guys sort of um, hold up together in Buffalo, I believe, right? It was outside of Buffalo. Outside That's of Buffalo. the studio where Dave Fridman has yeah. his studio. Which is cool because a lot of times, as you were talking about, like, you know, you write songs and you record stuff like piecemealing and you're in New York and you go in and you hear, sometimes you stay for the overdub, sometimes you don't. But being when you're living together and you have to live through a record and you work with the producer that 
makes you sort of, you know brings everything together like that it's a different experience and i think this record really shows it's one of your strongest records for sure do you feel I, I know your last record is always like oh this is my strongest record but i think it really is one of your strongest records for for someone who's known you for a while casually but also you know being a fan of the band so I um I definitely want to jump to a few other songs on the record too, and and, and I do want to hear a couple of stories about you know the meanings behind because some of your early stuff, whether it's obstacle or evil, like I really never understood like what the stories were behind those songs, and they're such great songs. But for me, I, I I'd love to know like you know where they came from because they're amazing, and even the video to Evil was great. I was watching that Thank again you. last night. So, but um so talk about the making of the record for a second, like being being with the dudes for like you know a couple months and everything. I mean, it was in this house out yeah in the winter time outside of Buffalo. It was it was a very good experience, I think, um, and it's just part of how Dave Friedman works. You know, there's not really any negotiation. You come to a studio, you stay for a maximum of two weeks, and then you leave for like three weeks while he, I think he takes a week off, then he does two weeks with another band then like another week off, and then you come back a month later, maybe how it works. Uh, and two weeks is the limit because everyone goes batshit fucking crazy in right. this house in the middle of nowhere after two weeks. Um, I go crazy after a day, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what was cool about, like, you know, his thing, I mean, I generally want to be involved with every step of recording, so it's not it's not like we would just sort of walk in assembly line and leave on our previous records, but you're not always there for everything. And with Fridman, you're always there for everything. Right. And I think that's very... That's really good, even if it's a day where I'm just doing vocals. You know, Sam's in the house in case I decided last minute to change the lyric. Both those guys are there to be like, oh, like, what do you think about this? We're going to do a new thing. So I think it just made everything feel really organic and everything very familiar to everyone. No surprises to everyone, anyone in the band and everyone just of one mind to this thing that we're trying to do. And I think um, we also managed to kind of maintain a real minimalist approach to it. And I think it helped having everybody there to kind of you know, it's it's tough. Everyone has to be on the same page for something to go all the way through to completion with the same concept. Definitely. Did that? Did the writing process start before then, or did you write long before spirit? then? Okay. We always, yeah, we always. Uh, right you know, firstly, Daniel writes for like a year by himself, and then he brings his oh, cool. songs to the to the rest of us, okay. and then we kind of build the Interpol record. So we had sent demos to Dave Fridman that were, you know, us playing the songs. It wasn't like us with vague ideas. It was like the songs. You still have that rehearsal place on the Bowery, or is that closed? No, now? we got kicked okay. out of there, man. And that I read that you shared one with the yeah, 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 yeah. years ago. Yeah, it was awesome. And yeah. then we got we got booted by the cops. Cool. For noise complaints. But so we we had finished writing in the this the music building on Eighth Avenue, and when Fridman heard the demos, it was his idea. He's like, why don't we record straight to tape? Let's keep it super live, you know because you can play the songs. So right. he had notes on like he wanted a couple songs faster, he wanted to like change a bass line on one song. He you know, he got under the hood with us, but I think a lot of his production approach was just to hear the demos and say let's not over make let's not make an overwrought record, let's make a traditional rock record with like really committed tape performances yeah. where you can't just like punch in a new performance and you know fuse things together it's like the band plays right or the way you it used it to be done right exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah and so that's cool so i want to know like because obviously one of you you know i'd love to know the story behind evil it's one of my favorite interpol songs so is there i mean because i don't know if you write all the lyrics yourself yeah no the, the lyrics are me um what's the story behind that song well there, oh, you're not evil so i, I had a, i had a stupid idea to call it the butter of evil which is a pun on the flower of evil by baudelaire in french it would rhyme and it was a stupid idea and so then that just got kind of <laughs> shortened to evil that's how the name of that song came about as far as stories especially in the early albums i never ever had an answer to those questions and i kind of felt like it was very it was my like i i wasn't interested in sort of helping people understand what i was trying to say i kind of felt like no the words are there to be the words okay, and then so. i don't do like secondary words <laughs> okay. about the first words right, to, right okay that's cool understandable for sure but i think in an, in another sense like the reason why some of those early songs are maybe more inscrutable than more recent ones is i feel like that sort of is a reflection of the chaos that i was perceiving at that point okay and instead of sort of like faking clarity and having like songs with stories and morals I kind of felt like my life doesn't feel that way at all. My life feels like extremely mysterious and like everything is confusion Definitely. and just like primal urges and frustrations. And so that was the language that I would use in songwriting. And I think now with the new record where there's maybe some stuff that you can wrap your head around a little bit more easily and understand like, oh, I think he's describing experiences that he's had. I think that's because I now just have a little bit more clarity where I can kind of 
that's you know well you're at a different phase in your life too exactly, right? exactly yeah. but it's funny because i think you filmed unless i'm incorrect i think you filmed if you really love nothing uh, in my favorite restaurant in la jones we uh, weren't we didn't get to be there oh. we, the part where the band is in we were in mexico city actually uh, okay. but i think you're right the, the stuff in la yeah. was shot there but. i only i mean I, that's literally my favorite spot in la is it do you have I a favorite go. restaurant you ever go to in la um, i've seen you at a, one or two but sushi I, park is probably my favorite i love that one it's great yeah it's not, it costs a pretty penny, so I don't go there every day, but it's a great spot. Yeah. I do love it. It's I mean, fun. I'll take Sugarfish all day, I too, like, man. My friend owns Sugarfish. Shout out to Lele. What's Whoa, up? Oh, shout out. Um, hey, man, so one other, well, a couple of things I want to touch base on. Uh, you have, like, a real strong connection from identity-wise to fashion, and I feel like another thing that it sort of identified the band was you always wore suits, ties. You had a real cool look about you, and obviously I, I read the other day that you even worked at, like, Interview Magazine and Gotham Magazine, I guess, back in the day, right? So. Yep. You know, and I come from the school that image and rock and roll should all be synergistic. And there's so many bands that we talk about all the time, but that are faceless now in rock and roll. And I don't want to mention any band names, but there's a million bands that you don't even know what they look like now. So yeah. was that was that part of your identity, like important to you? Was it conscious? Was it just like, hey, we all look cool in you know, suits? Or were you thinking about bands from back in the day, like the Stones or the like any band that had an identity where fashion yeah. was a yeah. big part of it? I mean, that's a great question. It's really interesting because I think, A, we were all thinking about different bands. Uh, B, because, you know, grunge for me was it. You know, Nirvana right. was it. And that right. was sort of when I was 16, I was dressing in holy sweaters and, you know, and uh, plaid shirts and ripped jeans and stuff. And that was like, that was the fashion template that, that stuck with me sort of in, a, in formative years. I think Daniel was into the jam. Right. Like those dudes wore uh, suits. Right. I just think in the fashion scene in New York City at that time... I would go out in suits. There was a couple clubs that I would like. I would, and then when Interpol first started, for me it was like this. Um, personally, it was a comment that like I hated my job. I hated everything I was doing except for like playing in a band. Right. So that the band was the serious part of my life. I felt like okay, I want to wear a suit and tie to this because this is the shit that's but important. But not to a regular job. And I don't really want to wear it. You know, I don't give a shit what I wear to like this job I have right. that I fucking hate. Yeah. Um, Did you have a regular job at that point? I mean, so? and it wasn't even that I hated it because it was like at the early days I was at interview and it was such intelligent, cool people around me and it felt like a really great career, but it wasn't my dream. Right. And because if you already know what your dream is, then everything else is just like time you wish you could have back. Totally. That is taken from you. But so. it is interesting that you started at like a fashion magazine when you were younger and then the band of me had a very strong aesthetic. Cause well, I think that's just I mean, you gravitate to stuff. That you you're know, into, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and I think, so what was the other thing about the band with suits is that we all had it within our sort of natural repertoire to wear a suit and dress up. And so that just became a very easy thing that we could all do without. And I think the real difference is I think you can get guys together and a stylist can put them in suits, but like there'll be two dudes that don't wear suits and they don't look right in suits because right. it's not like their thing. So you guys all and look good in suits. I think we all kind of, we like <laughs> suits. It yeah. wasn't like the first time we put on a suit was because our bandmates said wear this suit. It was like that was just something that we all were comfortable with. So Definitely. I think you get that cohesive, organic quality to it too. And then I completely agree as far as presentation and look being important. Yeah, I, absolutely. Yes, 100%. super conscious choices there. Do you have a favorite track from Banks and Steels? Because I want to talk about your collaboration with RZA. Obviously, I, I work with a ton of hip hop artists, so we'll have to get you. We work with like Gucci Mane and Cardi B, and I work with so many. Um, so cool. I feel like we'll have to uh, do some kind of Paul Banks collaboration with some of the art because I you collaborate with a lot of people on that record. Yeah, um, so, I did. A, I did a mixtape before that record too. That I had some really. I had Talib Kweli on my mixtape. I had LP from yeah. the Jewels on it. I had Mike G from uh, Odd Future. Yeah, I saw that. And I had High Prism, who was from my favorite rap trio in New York called Anti Pop Consortium. Yeah, I love that. So you have a favorite track on that record because I kind of want want to jump to one of those tracks from that record because I think it'd be cool for people to hear that. The eclectic sounds of Banks and Steels, and it's just a, a great overall record. I was checking it out today. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. For me, I think it'd be a, it's pretty much a deep, deep cut. It's called uh, Conceal. Okay, so we're going to jump to Conceal. Banks and Steels, you're listening to Paul Banks on Lips LA Radio, Dash Radio. Paul is playing the Hollywood Bowl this week with Interpol. Hey there, this is Brandon Boyd from the band Incubus, and you're listening to Scott Lips on Lips LA. We just listened to a, a great track from Banks and Steels, but we were talking about Migos and hip-hop and culture. And what were you saying, Paul? Well, just when was it that real high fashion and hip-hop artists, because you said you work with some of these, yeah, represent hip-hop yeah, artists I within do. fashion. And I I'm do. trying to think when did, in my mind, it's sort of, I mean, I know it's been coming for a while, and maybe Pharrell is an early yeah. point. 
I mean, like, I, it's such an important part of the branding of an artist now, especially in hip hop. And it's funny because, yeah, we were talking about, you know, people like dogging on it or liking it or whatever it may be. But I think, listen, you, you can't get away from it. I mean, the biggest artist in the world, whether you Rihanna has her makeup line, right? And, and mm, she's killed it with that makeup line, money. right? So, you know, all these hip hop artists, obviously a lot of them, you know, have done really well in the branding space. And it's a big part of what I do because actually honestly people are more interested in a lot of hip hop artists I work with on a branding front now than I would also work with rock and roll artists every day but I also I'm also going where cultural is taking me so um, it's interesting man it's such a such an interesting time and I think like if you look at the current fashion campaigns it's always interesting to see which brands are tapping into hip hop and which brands are using models and which brands are using you know influencers or whatever it, be, so. it was like maybe as long as seven or eight years ago, there was these kids that came out of Webster Hall near me. And this was like, this is before the Migos rise. So I guess like the high fashion thing was probably maybe closer to like ASAP Rocky's rise where yeah. like it was, but these dudes were in like fucking the ski, the full face ski masks yeah. and it had like Chanel logos on it. Yeah. And I don't know if that was official product or mm, what. Probably not. But that was such a cool look. I yeah. mean, it was scary to see this group of dudes yeah. in full face ski masks like rolling out of a club. But Definitely. But I just, from a fashion standpoint, I was like, that's dope. No, well, I, and it's, I think it's such an important part now of the story of artists. I mean, especially uh, hip hop, because I think it's, it's like, listen, it's, it's another outlet to be creative and it's another outlet to brand yourself. And, you know, obviously you want a, the right artist to be in the right brand. But I, I feel like because I came from music, I have a, a bit of an understanding about what brands make sense. Like I don't bring an alternative rock artist like McDonald's or something. No, mm. no, no disrespect to McDonald's, but I think you have to know your audience and you have to know who fits with what. But, um, hey, man, so just let's talk, like, wrap it up and talk about this tour a little bit. So this tour is coming to an end. So have you done a bunch of dates with The Kills? Or my, I mean, I'm very close with those guys, too. So The Kills is a band that we've known forever. We've definitely done shows with them and just been on the same bills at festivals. Yeah. Um, Daniel's a real diehard fan. Oh, um, Jamie and Daniel are good friends. Yeah, That's why yeah. I remember because I had Jamie in here. Jamie's actually on our show Friday, his episode. And we were, um, we were talking. I remember... I was like, who who am I friends with that's friends with Daniel? And now I remember it's Jamie. Yeah. So shout out to Jamie. Yeah, yeah. Great, um, great band. Yeah, so really that's great. how that happened? You guys were just yeah, friends? Yeah, we're just big fans. Cool. Yeah, big fans. You know, they didn't have a drummer for like the first five years of their band. I always talked to him about it. He's like, nobody wanted to play with us. I was like, I doubt that's really what happened. So <laughs> so is it, so you're doing a few dates with them or is this like... I think it might just be the one. And okay. then we've been on the road with Sunflower Bean. Right, who, um, who I actually represent. I represent Julia. Wow. Yeah. So I'm telling you, there's so many connections. We could cool. go for hours. Yeah. But um, I feel like Dude could also be fashion, um, the guitar player, singer. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. feel like he's got a real good look. Yeah. They, Julie, just, they have everything they need to be yeah, a big band. Totally. I think. To- yeah. She's, they're coming on the show tomorrow morning. It's funny. So super talent. It's great. And, and it's, she did like YSL stuff, and that's a great example. But really? she, yeah, she always knew that she was in her heart. She's like more of a musician. I mean, I, that's really my soul, too. So it's, um, it's funny. It's just cool. I, I love when all these worlds merge. But um, tell me what's up for 2019, brother. So you're doing the show. Do you ever get nervous, by the way, when you're playing like a big show like that? Um, Not really. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, nervousness. I don't even know what that. I'll get more nervous, you know, if I'm making a toast at a dinner. Right. But I get like elevated adrenaline in me before a show. Right. So okay. it's not like a bad nerve. It's like a. Just Elevation. like a heat. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, like a New York show, Life on the Road, sometimes it's just easier to kind of like, look, I'm going to sleep well, I'm going to go to sound check, and right. I'm going to do like, a, you know, the best show that I can do. Yeah. Uh, sometimes there's like a lot going a- around with the gig when you're Definitely. in a hometown or like a big city where you got like all your friends there yeah. and everyone's hitting you up last minute for can guest Can I get tickets? And, That's going to be me no in 10 problem, minutes. I'm like, like, Paul, can I get in? Which is good because we're a couple <laughs> days ahead. But right. like when it's the day of the show yeah. and I'm like rushing here and there and like, you know, yeah, it's, it's, a lot. it's a lot. all people you can't say no to and you yeah. want to see and yada, yada. Yeah. So it gets, it gets a little hectic. But uh, I just love being in L.A., man. Yeah, I so really, you like it here. That's cool. I, yeah, I really love L.A. That's awesome. I, I got the extreme pleasure to play the bowl like two and a half years ago. It was the greatest day of my life. And wow. everybody asked me the greatest day of my life. And I say, playing there, I was nervous as hell. I could barely play because all I could think about was I'm going to fuck this up. And and it's going to be the worst day of my life. But I, I made it through. My parents flew in, which is awesome. So, I, I, you know, when I go to shows there, every time I go, I was just there for Beck the other day. I always sit there and I'm like, fuck, it's so weird. I played here. It's so amazing. That's but, cool. Was that with um, Courtney? We, we toured with Lana Del Rey. So we did the tour together. We played there. But Dope. um, but yeah, I mean, it was awesome. So I, I'm, I'm super excited. Hopefully I'm going to get to see you play. 
Um, and uh, anything else on store for 2019? Because I'm sure there's always like a million things. Yeah, well, up, it's, so. you know, the, the way that we structure a campaign, it, you know, the album only came out August 2018. Right, right. So, I mean, there's a plan all the way up until like September next year. Cool. Uh, and it's just shows, shows, shows. I know we're going to be in Australia for New Year. Cool. Great. Um, and then in February, I know we do the States. I guess no, the fall of this year, we go to UK as well. Um, I don't know, man. I guess we'll just do some more loops of the States and Europe next year and then summer festivals. That's that's the big end point. Well, you gotta, you guys got to go out. Everyone go out and buy the sixth Interpol record. Um, and and uh, Paul, thanks for taking the time. I know you're busy today. You have I, a lot I mean, of if, stuff going on. Thank you very and, much for having me. If, I can go another five if you well, want. Well, we got to take some pictures. There's so much you know what we have okay. to do. We have to promote the show to be on. So I wish, you know, so we got to factor time. And Paul's a busy man. But I'm um, excited to come to the gig, hopefully. And, uh, and yeah, man, it's, uh, it's going to be great seeing you guys. Love the new record. Everybody go out and buy it. Check out the videos, the Rover it being one of my favorite videos from the record. And, um, yeah, man, always great to see you, Paul. Thanks, you too. And thanks, I will brother. for sure get you into the gig. Cool. Dude, thanks. Of course. <laughs> thanks. You're listening to Lips LA with Scott Lips.